Great. So uh, without further ado, let me hand you over to um, Omar Magana, who's going to talk about multi-photon quantum state uh, engineering fundamentals and applications. And Omar is from Louisiana State University. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, thanks to the organizers for putting together this very nice uh, workshop and for inviting me to speak uh, today. So the experiments that I will describe today uh, were performed in collaboration with, with this team. The first three colleagues are members from my group at LSU. Uh, Mario and Roberto are from UNAM. Armando and Kurt from Institute. Frederick and Alexander are from the University of Rockstock. And Adriana, Rich, Sewu, and Thomas Gerritz are from NIST. So before I uh, start talking about multi-photon states, I would like to introduce you to the quantum photonics group at LSU. So we are a new experimental group and we are interested in building uh, photonic technologies. So our research is broad and we do uh, quantum imaging. So I will describe it today. We engineer complex superposition of photons for fundamental and applied research. In collaboration with the Max Born Institute and the University of Rockstock, we are uh, exploring high dimensional uh, higher order exceptional points in photonic lattices. And we're also exploring uh, or building hybrid uh, quantum networks for information processing. So we have here a plasmonic network and we illuminate it with single photons and we do uh, experiments. So as we all know, uh, the complexity of quantum systems and the potential of some quantum technologies is scaled with the number of photons that we can uh, prepare. And this has motivated uh, our community to uh, perform like very nice experiments in which multiple uh, properties of photons are used to prepare complex superpositions. And for example, we have, or people have used uh, the frequency of photons uh, the spatial properties of light, such as the orbital angular momentum, uh, polarization. And <clears throat> these complex states have been used to, in general, to do information processing. And this has been done in on chip and also uh, using uh, free space uh, protocols. The experiment that I will describe today uh, are, of course, multi-photons, so are related, but instead of tweaking the excitation mode of, of the field, sorry, instead of tweaking the, the uh, instead of tweaking additional degrees of freedom of light, we uh, engineered the excitation mode of the field. In 1997, uh, Dagna and co-workers introduced a new form of uh, conditional measurement that enabled the possibility of performing quantum state engineering, but at a new fundamental level in which the excitation mode of the field was manipulated. And as I will explain it soon, this was performed through uh, photon subtraction. And this is very nice because you can you can uh, engineer uh, the statistical properties of light to generate beams that look like uh, sunlight or like laser light or just like light emitting from, emitted from uh, single photon sources. So it's a powerful technique in this field. And this is the approach that we use in our protocol. So we start with, uh, or we use two motes with vacuum states. Uh, these are produced by pumping a nonlinear crystal through a process of uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion. So we pump a nonlinear crystal, we generate two modes. And most of the time, if we measure this state, we will find the state in, in a vacuum state. But sometimes we'll generate two photons, four photons, six photons, and mathematically this superposition can be described like that. In this case, the parameter C 
uh, describe the brightness of the source and it's called uh, the squeezing parameter. And then N are just the modes, the number of photons in each of the modes. As you can see, this is an entangled state. And this is the state that we modify to generate this uh, uh, multi-photon state that I will describe now. So this is what we do, or this is the device that we want to implement. Basically, it's a tunable source of multi-photon states. So here we have uh, like a cartoon showing what we do. So we have two states, but we generate multiple photons in each of the modes. And we can control uh, the mean photo number. That's one of the things that we can control. We can control the statistical fluctuations of each of the modes. And we can control the relations. So we have that. And in order to do that, we tweak uh, two parameters, the number of photons that we subtract and the brightness of the source. So as you might know, subtracting photons from two motor squeeze vacuum might be hard. So one of the requirements is to have a very bright source of correlated photon pairs. And then you need to do uh, photon number resolving detection. If you can meet these requirements, you can just build it in your lab. And this is basically our experimental setup. The first part of the sort that I will explain in a moment is based on the work by Harder and colleagues. So our source is not as bright as their, they call it uh, a source for mesoscopic quantum optics. So it's not as bright as that, but it's enough to engineer these multi-photon states. So we have a pulse laser, we have, we shape the spectral profile of, of our pump, and then we pump a waveguide. So this is a commercial waveguide, and when you buy it, you have multiple samples. So you have to test one by one till you get uh, the photons that you need. Some of them are very bright, but they produce different photons with different colors. Some of them are degenerate, but they are not that bright, so one has to, to try. So we generate signal and idler, and then we use a fiber couplers I will provide more details about these fiber couplers in, in the next slide. And then we send these to uh, photon number solving detectors. And here we have some traces. So for example, here we detect zero photons, one, two, three, four, five. And if we have these traces, we can do histogram and do all the, the and we can analyze the statistics of, of the light field. So this is the idea and, uh, and the theoretical uh, uh, proposal was published a few years ago uh, by Carranza and Gary and Joseph B. And this is the idea. So with, with the previous source, we generate these two motor squeeze vacuum state. Now let's assume that we simultaneously subtract photon from both modes, and then we will get this new state. In a minute, I will describe how we subtract them. So we have this state, which is also an entangled state, but in this case, the coefficient is more complicated. So this coefficient B depends on the number of photons that we have in the source. So this means the brightness the, or, or the squeezing parameter. And it also depends on the number of photons that we subtract. And then we have another term here. So, and this is good because this means that if we can tweak the brightness of the source or the number of photons that, that we can subtract, we can tweak this coefficient and then we can engineer the superposition, we can tweak the mean photon number, and of course we, can, we should be able to also tweak the degree of correlation between modes A and B. So this is like the general idea. So how we do it? So if we have signal here and idler here, we just inject these two modes on, into two uh, fiber couplers with this transmission. So that we transmit 90% of the beams, and this 10% goes to another detector. And these 10% of the photons are the photons that we subtract. So this is probabilistically that one of the things that probably has to be improved later because everything is probabilistic, but that's how we subtract uh, photons from the two mode squeeze vacuum state. So again, we start with this state and we end up with that, with this other state. So why photon subtraction works? So here I have a cartoon. This is probably not the most accurate way of, of explaining that, but it gives an idea. 
of why photon subtraction works. So as I said, we have two modes to squeeze vacuum. If we just take a look to one of the two modes in the, in, in the two modes squeeze vacuum state, then most of the time, I mean, if we're lucky, we will detect a photon, but most of the time we will see a vacuum state. So we won't measure anything. And then if we perform, let's say, these uh, five realizations of the experiment, so we have three photons, then we have to divide three by five. And that, roughly speaking, that will be our mean photon number. But let's assume that now I subtract photons, so I can add a beam splitter, and I transmit 90% of the photons, and then I reflect 10. So here, if this red detector sees a photon, that means that we don't have a vacuum state then I can tell this other detector to collect a measurement. So by doing this, I can filter the vacuum. So and every time I detect a photon here, I will see something here. So basically I'm filtering the vacuum and by doing that, I'm art artificially increasing the mean photon number because I don't have zeros anymore. And so this is how you can understand that the mean photon number changes. And this is like a joint photon number distribution plot for two mode squeeze vacuum states. So the most prominent term is the vacuum. But if we filter it and then we renormalize, we can change the photon distribution. And if we change the photon distribution, we're changing other properties like the statistical fluctuations of light or, or even the degree of correlations as I will show it. So here, for example, so these, all these terms look very small in comparison to the vacuum, but we have some photons here. Now, if we get rid of the vacuum, then this uh, term will look uh, stronger. And this is why we get these kind of distributions. Yeah, so this is the fact that one can expect using uh, uh, or implement and photon subtraction, but there's another nice thing. As you can see here, now the photon number, if we, if we take a look to the marginal, the photon number distribution will look slightly different. It won't look like this negative exponential. So when you analyze the Mandel parameter for these states, you realize that the Mandel parameter can be negative, zero, or positive. And that depends on the number of photons that you subtract. So that means that you can generate these modes, so they, they will be entangled because, or, or, or quantumly correlated, but they can have different statistics. And there are points, for example, if I do the experiment around this squeezing parameter, uh, the Mandel parameter will be zero, just like in coherent states. And then we can generate like entangled states in which each of the modes look like a coherent state. So in here, I'm just comparing the photon subtracted states with the coherent state for this mean photon number. So this is one of the states that we can uh, generate. So these are our uh, experimental uh, results. So if we just collect, uh, if we just do the experiment without subtracting photons, this is the joint spectrum that we see. Uh, and then as we start subtracting photons, you can see that the vacuum component decreases. So here, the vacuum component is smaller than the one one term. And then we, we end up with this distribution. So you can see that the effect is here. This is in the joint photon number distribution. This can be signal, this can be idler. And we're able to subtract up to three photons. So just to show you a comparison, the first row is, uh, the first row is uh, our experiment. The second row is uh, the theoretical predictions, assuming uh, an overall system efficiency of 16%. So you can see that the setup works even if you have high amount of losses. So it's robust in that sense. And here in the, in the last row, we have the marginal distribution. So you can see that this looks like thermal as, as what we spec for, two modes, for one of the modes in two-mode squeeze vacuum. And as we keep subtracting more and more photons, we get a distribution that looks almost like the distribution you spec for coherent states. <clears throat> Cool, so we have seen that we can subtract photons. Of course, if we are uh, moving the distribution, 
in this direction, then that means that the mean photon number is higher as we subtract more photons. But what can we say about uh, correlations? So to analyze correlations, we measure the aggregate parameter. So the aggregate parameter is like the Mandel parameter, but for a pair of states. So, and it's given by this expression. And the aggregate parameter is negative for quantum correlated states. So if you have a state and it has quantum correlations, the aggregate parameter will be negative. So it should be close to, it should be zero for coherent state and will be positive for, for thermal. So as we can see, uh, all our numbers are negative. So that means that we have quantum correlation, but the aggregate parameter doesn't tell you much about the strength of this correlation. So we don't know if the correlations, if the strength of the correlations increases or decreases as we subtract more photons. So we were not able to do quantum state tomography. So what we did is we uh, found a new metric based on, the, based on the eigenvalues of the joint correlation matrix. Uh, you can find, uh, I mean, I won't go into too much detail. You can find additional uh, information and theory in, in our paper. But what we found is that the eigenvalues of this uh, uh, joint correlation matrix get more negative as we subtract more and more photons. So this is, for example, these two points are for what well, zero subtraction. Then we have these three points for the case in which we subtract one, two, and three photons. So as you can see, the eigenvalues become more negative as we subtract more photons. That means that the degree of correlations uh, get stronger. So as we subtract more photons, we induce stronger and stronger correlations. We can also change uh, the mean photon number. And as I showed before, we can also change the shape so we can change the statistics of, of this state. So this is a tunable source. Uh, and now we, we are using it. So one of the things that we are doing is, uh, well, we, we are exploring a, uh, higher order exceptional points in photonic lattices. And now with, with the previous source, I show you that we can prepare these multi-photon states. So, and we can prepare these states and our technique is not heralding, but for practical purposes, it can be used as heralding because if you subtract a given number of photons, then then you know the mean photon number of, of the wave packet, and then you can use that. It's like pre or post selection. It depends on how you apply it. So recently we've, uh, we, we published a paper in which we show an efficient way of performing photon number solving detection. So we're injecting these uh, multi-photon states in these kind of chips uh, fabricated at Rockstock, Rockstock, the University of Rockstock. And this is, I mean, this is our source. Uh, so we check the indistinguishability using a Hongo Mandel experiment, and this is how the chip looks. So we have here, we inject the multi-photon states here, and we were working on that. And I hope to to report uh, results soon about this experiment. So it seems like we have some time. So I will go to the last part of my presentation. So. Before we use pre-selection, uh, post-selection to uh, engineer multi-photon states, now I want to discuss how you can use a multi-photon state without pre- or post-selection to measure, uh, uh, to perform a quantum phase estimation. So as you know, uh, interferometry has been used to, uh, for metrology and uh, people have been using all kinds of states, classical and quantum states, probably the most common states are these, coherent, thermal, squeezed, or entangled states to perform or to measure small physical parameters. So we use an interferometer because the change in the fringes gives some information about the phase or any other parameter, and that's how you use it. And people have been paying particular attention to uh, entangle or to quantum states just because you can reach a sensitivity that you cannot achieve uh, classically. So that's this is one of the motivations, and as probably you all know, this has been a very hot topic for the last uh, two decades. 
However, more, most of these protocols have been using, uh, well, not more, I said most, I should have said all of these protocols use uh, pre or post selection. And, and for example, this is a very nice work, beautiful, beautiful paper in which they interfere SPDC photons with uh, coherent photons. And they use that to infer a, a phase. So here, the, the authors show uh, the two photon interference, four photon interference, and they were able to observe like a higher uh, resolution in the number of fringes. But the resolution of the fringes is determined by how they, but by how they measure these photons. So by how they post select. So for example, here they, they measure three photons here and two here, and that gives them one uh, specific uh, frequency. So this is very nice, but when, when they combine coherent and SPDC, you have, you have a lot of terms, but these terms are not considered here just because they post select. So and this is the case almost in all of the protocols. Last year, uh, Pride and, and his team did the first experiment in which they were, they were able to estimate a phase uh, using all the resources without post-selecting or without pre-selecting. This is a very nice paper, but uh, still there's one thing missing here. When they, everything relies on an N equals to noon state, and when they produce more photon, let's say high, higher photon, higher order generation, that induces errors. So this motivates our next, uh, our next experiment and we said, okay, given the fact that photons are scarce in most of the quantum protocols, can we use all the photons and still do a quantum phase estimation? And we found out that, that that's possible and we can do that if we use photon number resolving detection. So as you all know, if when you use APDs or any other uh, click detector, all these events, will produce the same effect because you will get a click here and a click here, same, same for this case. It doesn't matter if you have two photos, you will get one click here, one click here. So in our case, we're able to discriminate all these possible events. And as I will show you, that's very important because when you use fissure information to estimate the phase, that dramatically changes your sensitivity of, of your setup. So here, of course, you need, in order to do this without pre or post selection, you need a very, very high uh, source of entangled photons. So the overall system efficiency is 84% in our experiment. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very efficient. And uh, of course, we have very uh, efficient detectors. And here I have some of the results. So when we, when we do, uh, when we do photo number resolving detection, we obtain these fringes. So the black line here is the total number of photons. That means that the total number of photons is conserved during the experiment. So here we have the probability of detecting one photon in signal, one photon in idler. And then uh, the red curve is the probability of detecting two zero and zero two. And then here in green, it looks like green, we have all the the higher order events. So when we zoom in here, uh, we, we generate, we generate uh, these plots that show higher order interference. So when we collapse all the photo number resolution, we get this clip detection that looks like Pride. So the big difference is that Pride has this offset and we don't have the offset. When we calculate that, we were able to dramatically uh, beat uh, the, the chat noise limit and not only for few uh, phases, but for a broad range of phases. So we're working on that. The chat noise limit should be here, but where uh, Chen Long Yu uh, uh, is working on that and we hope to report results soon. And with that, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. And, and please ask questions if you, if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. I'm, I'm clapping for the 200-odd uh, people who've been uh, watching your, your talk there. We've got, we've got time for uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, so uh, we'll start with uh, Gerardo uh, Suarez, who is asking, um, well, they say that they didn't quite understand the, the vacuum filtering process. Could you point them to a reference that discusses it? So I think they're asking for a, 
handy uh, reference? Uh, yes, so he can read the paper by Gary and, and Carranza. Let me, let me found it. So, oops, oops. Uh, yeah. So this is not the first paper about photon subtraction, of course, but it is a good reference to understand it. That Joe to be referenced on the bottom there. Yes, yes, the okay. 2012 paper from Carranza and Gary. Perhaps you could add that in the Slack as well. That might be useful for everybody to see. Yeah, um, I will. Cool, thank you. And then uh, uh, another quick question from uh, Marianne Crum, who asks, how do you extract more than one photon? Just adding more beam splitters, they're asking. Oh, that's a great question. So no, remember that we have, we have photon number resolving detection. And if we just wait long enough, we will get uh, a signal with this amplitude. And that means that we have two photon events. That's how we identify photons. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, well, well, we'll ask a couple of quick questions. There's one, one for me, and I think this is related. So I, I noted there was some, maybe some asymmetry in some of the data. So on, for example, slide 11. And then yeah. John Jeffers is also asking, so uh, is, is that asymmetry to do, to do with difference in efficiency? Um, and John Jeffers asks, are there any advantage is in deliberate asymmetry, i.e. where you subtract different photons in each arm? Yes, so what, what, yeah, these are, these are very good questions. In our paper, we have a supplementary material and actually we have some, uh, we study uh, the asymmetric case. So, yeah, so you can, you can generate like different wave packets with different mean photon numbers. And then when you correlate them, you get different uh, joint photon number distributions. That's discussed in our paper, that's a possibility. About the asymmetries, in 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 the in the number of uh, photons, the asymmetries. Well, the transmission uh, asymmetries. So this is a post selection, and 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 the asymmetries are important, but not that important because we just have to wait until we see the band that we want. And of course, just yes, because the photon number resolution of each of the detectors is slightly different, that also produces asymmetries in the data. But, but, uh, but I mean, this is something that, uh, that, that comes from the detectors and, and the photon number resolution of these detectors. Okay, great. Uh, there's a, there's a, a few more questions. I think they're going to get um, uploaded to the, to the Slack, uh, associated, yeah. the Slack channel associated with this talk. So thank you, Omar, and thank you to all of the speakers in today's session. So thank you very much.